Thank you everyone and welcome today to our the first of our Great Lakes discussion series. My name is Catherine Dougal and I'm the development and engagement Today we'll be discussing the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and more broadly how the funds should be spent. This event is a part of Bridge Michigan and Circle of Blues six part Great Lakes series where we'll be discussing important Great Lakes issues every other month. And this, this project we want to add is funded by the Herb Foundation, so thank you so much. If you're not familiar with Circle of Blue, who's our partner on this project, Circle of Blue is a nonprofit news organization that has dispatched its correspondents, photographers, and videographers across the US and around the world to report on the myriad threats to freshwater supply and quality. You can read their work at circleofblue.org. And if you aren't familiar with us here at Bridge Michigan, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan statewide news work, and you can read our coverage every day for free online at bridgemi.com. I also want to thank the Bridge members who are with us today and who help support our work. If you're not already a member and would like to become one, you can do so anytime at our website. And our membership director, Amber DeLind, is also going to drop a link into the chat for you. The schedule for our discussion today is that we'll begin with a conversation between Bridge Michigan environment reporter, Kelly House, and our two guests, Crystal and Robert. We will then open the discussion to reader questions for our panelists. Throughout the discussion, you can enter your questions into the chat at any time. And if you're calling in today, you can email your questions to us at membership at bridgemi.com. Just so you know, we are recording this discussion and we'll be posting the recording in Bridge, Michigan today or tomorrow. Now I'd like to introduce our two special guests who we have joining us today. The first is Crystal MC Davis, who is a respected professional with a career in government affairs that bloomed in Columbus, Ohio and Washington, DC. Crystal is currently with Alliance for the Great Lakes as its Vice President of Policy and Strategic Engagement and leads the organization's efforts related to Lake Erie, drinking water policy advocacy and relationship building across the region. To return to Greater Cleveland, Crystal left her position in DC as the Federal Relations Director for Kent State University, where she established KSU's Federal Office and Policy Agenda on Capitol Hill. Crystal is a graduate of Kent State University and a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. She is an Ohio Lake Erie Commissioner, Environmental Commissioner, and member of the JEDI Committee for the City of Twinsburg, Ohio. Uh, we are also joined today by Robert Burns, who is not going to be joining us on video, um, but we will have his audio today, so he is with us live. Robert Burns grew up on the Detroit River and spent much of his teenage years hunting, fishing, and exploring the uninhibited islands and shorelines around the Lower River. After college, he spent the first part of his career doing project management work for a local marine construction and dredging company, where one of his first jobs was doing navigational dredging on the Roof River. From this experience, he received a good education to problems caused by industrial discharges, sewer overflows, and the impacts of contaminated sediment on the Rouge. For the last 20 years, Robert has worked for Friends of the Detroit River and serves as a Detroit Riverkeeper. His duties include working on water quality, habitat loss, and contaminated sediment issues, which are currently being addressed under the Detroit River Area of Concerns Remedial Action Plan. He also serves as FDR's technical advisor, for the habitat restoration projects that Friends of the Detroit Bridge River is currently implementing. Now to pass it over to the woman of the hour, Bridge Michigan environment reporter, Kelly House. Thanks, Catherine. And thanks again to both of you for being here, Crystal and uh, Bob. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to quickly note for readers, if you're not that familiar with the restoration initiative or what we're gonna be talking about today, um, I can direct you to two resources amongst many others that you can probably find. One, an article that <clears throat> I wrote last month that talks about the windfall that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, and two, a video from our friends at Detroit Public Television that really explains what the initiative is. So I'm going to drop those in the chat in a moment. Um, but with that, we'll kind of get to the, the questions. And I just first want to ask each speaker, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about the work you do 
and how it impacts the Great Lakes and our region's waterways. And let's start with Crystal. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you today. Um, as Catherine noted, I'm with the Alliance for the Great Lakes and serving as the Vice President of Policy and Strategic Engagement. Um, the Alliance for the Great Lakes, for those who aren't as familiar, are, is a 51-year-old traditional environmental organization based in Chicago with six offices throughout the Great Lakes state. Um, largely, we work on policy initiatives related to the Great Lakes. Um, it's easiest to talk about our work in three categories, aquatic invasive species, addressing agricultural runoff and agriculture and water issues, and then our drinking water work, which covers um, lead service line replacement, water affordability, and aging water infrastructure. We're also known for uh, a suite of stewardship programs, uh, most prominently our adopt a beach program, where we have teams of volunteers that clean up the beach. And so our relationship to GLRI and all of these issues is that we were created to serve and protect the lakes. Bob, we'll kick it over to you. All right, thank you. And thank you again for having me today. I appreciate that being here. The Friends of Detroit River is a nonprofit organization that was established in the early 1990s. We primarily work on water quality issues, habitat loss, restoration and protection, public access and environmental justice issues at a local level around the Detroit River. We work closely with area residents, community leaders, businesses, industries, city administrators, local universities, state and federal legislators, and agencies such as EPA, Army Corps of Engineers, NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and EGLE to address these issues. I also serve as Detroit River Keeper, and in this capacity, I have a broader reach working with eight other Great Lakes Keeper groups around Michigan on such things as petroleum pipeline crossing and spill concerns, Great Lakes water level, periodic flooding and drought issues, and federal and state legislative initiatives. The Waterkeeper Alliance, which is our parent organization, has over 300 waterkeeper organizations like ours around the U.S. and internationally, and is currently focusing on a lot of a lot of its efforts towards global climate change and worldwide habitat loss. Thanks to you both, and I want to just provide a little context before we move forward um, on the initiative. So, for those who aren't familiar, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is a funding program federal funding program that was launched a little more than a decade ago. And it funds all sorts of work from cleaning, you know, cleaning up contaminated sites to uh, battling invasive species, um, reconnecting floodplains and habitat and public access to waterways. And one of the big impetus um, for starting it was that we'd had all these new environmental laws in the 1970s. Have I been muted this entire time? Oh, okay. Um, so we had, you know, a host of environmental laws that tamped down on a lot of pollution from the previous century, but we had not been making a lot of progress in recovering from the damage that had already been done. Uh, in the 11 years since the initiative um, was launched, it's dedicated 3.8 billion to a host of issues in the Great Lakes, uh, but now, um, in the Infrastructure Act that was passed last year, it's received a billion dollar funding boost in addition to its annual funding uh, that could increase to 475 million annually by 2026. So it's flush with more money than ever before. And that's why these conversations are ongoing about how best to spend this money as we move forward. So with that context out of the way, can each of you talk about, you know, in the past 11 years of this initiative, how you've seen its impact on Great Lakes and adjacent waterways. And I guess we'll lead with Bob this time. Uh, yeah, so in uh, 2005, uh, based on work that FDR had been doing to improve the Detroit River, EPA and, the, and asked FDR if they'd be willing to take over efforts to oversee the implementation of the Detroit River Mediation Plan for the Detroit River area of concern. Um, there were 43 area concerns were established around the Great Lakes in 1987 as part of an amendment to the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between the U.S. and Canada. Problems such as impacts to water quality and habitat loss that resulted from decades of unregulated industrial and municipal discharges, in addition impacts from combined sewer overflows or CSOs, 
Hardening of shorelines and contaminated legacy sediments have led to the loss of animal and fish populations. The problem up until recently is that there was never any direct funding sources established to address the problems found in each of the AOCs until the GLI program was enacted. In the last 10 years since the GLI uh, was started, FDR and, and our partners have implemented over $30 million worth of habitat restoration, ha uh, habitat restoration uh, projects in the Detroit River, and millions more have been made available to uh, address contaminated sediment remediation. So we benefited greatly from uh, the GLI process, and and really, like I say, the the, the whole AOC uh, process has been uh, remediation process been going on since the early 1990s. But it wasn't really until this last 10 years, with the influx of funding from GLR directly to support our work, have we really been able to make some real strides forward to uh, address particularly habitat loss. And now with the new monies coming in, we have a lot of, uh, of funding to help uh, deal with uh, legacy contaminated sediments. And Crystal, what do you see as some of the big impacts? Um, I think there's a lot. I think uh, I've been a strong proponent of the program. I've advocated for it at the federal level. I think one of the things that's most notable is there are several reports that outline the return on investment, which I think is important, especially in this climate. If we're going to put more money to it, we want to know that it's a worthy investment. And so um, I know that for every federal dollar spent on GLRI, there was a report that said that there would be an additional $3.35 of additional economic um, activity in the Great Lakes through 2036. And so I'd say that that's a good investment that we know is a thriving program um, worthy of our attention. Um, and I think it's notable to say that we've had over 5,400 programs since the program, um, since the initiative has started as well, uh, projects. And so um, it's thriving. I've seen uh, successes throughout the Great Lakes and it's one of the tools in our toolbox, if you will, that we're utilizing to clean up the lakes. And Crystal, you know, representing a group with a real regional perspective, mm -hmm. obviously this is federal, you know, a federal funding program, but it's my understanding that a lot of the work that's actually happening on the ground is through state or local groups. Can you talk to us a bit about how that federal, state, and lo local partnership works and what it looks like? Sure. Um, I feel like I've said this uh, repetitively the last year because um, we've had so many discussions about not just GLRI, but the infrastructure dollars and all of the things happening around the lakes, good things. But all of the water challenges that we're facing are going to require an all hands on deck approach. And so there's not gonna be a single action at the federal level that's gonna clean up the lakes. It's really gonna take action at the state and local levels as well. Um, GLRI is no exception. So there will be federal dollars, but we know that uh, those dollars work better when they are coupled with state investment as well. And then there is um, responsibility at the local level, not just with local government, but with local community groups and, and the like in terms of working on implementing these uh, pro projects and programs. And so it, again, it's an all hands on deck um, situation. I think you froze for a moment there, or maybe I did. Yeah, I think you, you froze. Sorry, I think I'm the one who good. froze for a moment. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that's it. So um, thanks, I missed the tail end of that, I apologize. But a um, uh, question for both of you. You know, this initiative obviously has a stated goal of, uh, you know, accelerating efforts to protect and restore the Great Lakes. How do you think it has done on delivering results so far? And let's keep it with Crystal since I've already got you um, moving and then we'll go to Bob. I think that the, the program has been successful and that's why it's continued, um, is getting continued and increased funding. I'm, I'm proud of the program and the things that, that we've been able to achieve through the partnerships created from the funding. Um, I think it's important to, to again say that it's a tool it's a major tool, but it's one of the tools in our toolbox that we're using to address our water challenges and that it's not a silver bullet. And so sometimes we can have lofty expectations for programs um, thinking that it was the end all. It was never created 
to be the silver bullet that cleans everything up. But I think in, um, in conjunction with other programs and other funding sources, GLRI is, is uh, an amazing program. And Bob, how do you uh, rank its performance so far? Yeah, you know, I agree with what Crystal's saying. I think, uh, again, um, you know, I've been working uh, in this area for over 20 years now, and, and it, it, it was really hard to energize people to, uh, to get involved when, you know, the funding wasn't there to really follow through on, on all the projects we wanted to get done. And I think, as Crystal says, you know, this is one more tool in the chest here of, of things we can use to, uh, to move the process forward. But I think, you know, being directly funding a lot of the work we're doing, this has been very critical. You know, we worked in the past with, uh, you know, Superfund and Legacy Act to help deal with contaminated sediments. Um, and, you know, and that's helped and worked out. But, but with this program is really directly linked to the AOC work and, and a lot of the money is being funneled into the AOCs and it's really given a boost to uh, getting a lot of things done. So it's been very important. And I think, again, with the infrastructure bill is another thing we have coming down the line here. That's going to bring even more money in. Again, we've got a billion dollars coming directly to GLRI. But I think also uh, the fact that it's going to have a lot of impact on some of uh, the generators of some of our problems with trying to uh, uh, fix some of our ailing uh, uh, infrastructure with so drinking water, but particularly with sanitary and stormwater issues that are contributing to some of the problems we're dealing with. So all of these things, I think, are working together in unison to help uh, give us the tools we need to get the work done. But it really has sparked a lot of uh, a lot of uh, energy on, on our parts because we now have the funding available to get the work done. And a follow up on that. Can each of you remark um, on what you see as maybe some of the biggest accomplishments um, where, you know, and specifically what that has looked like, where these things have happened and uh, where has it fallen short so far? Sure, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, I think uh, just time is relative in this pandemic. I don't know if things happened last month or last year and so that's part of my struggle here. But um, when the world was still open a little bit ago, a couple of years ago, we were celebrating in Cleveland, I'm in Cleveland, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the river burning. And I know that's kind of odd to celebrate that, but it was a celebratory moment because we were thinking back about the 50th, I meant the 50th anniversary, the 50th anniversary of um, the, Earth Day and the Clean Water Act and all of these notable accomplishments that happened in the 70s and the fact that um, some of the environmental justice uh, landmark movements happened around that time right there in Cleveland. And the river didn't burn, the Cuyahoga River didn't burn one time. To our recollection, it happened uh, at least 12 times. And so I say GLRI is, is a program that's noteworthy because we were literally standing on the Cuyahoga River talking about um, the improvements that have been made with the lake uh, since that time period. And we had people who were there, in the, who was there in the 70s and here today and can talk about the, the improvements that have been made and the investment, um, the GLRI dollars that have been invested into the lake and how uh, we're seeing the returns on those investments. So I think, that's part of the successes that, that I see that are personal to me living near the Cuyahoga River. Um, I think in terms of areas of potential opportunity and growth, again, I support the program. I feel like I have to keep saying this disclaimer because when you critique something, sometimes people take it as it's a negative thing. No, I think there are opportunities for growth. Um, in the last couple of years, there has been an increased focus on environmental justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion, rightfully so. Um, and there have been lots of grassroots activists who have been beating this drum for years, and I'm happy to see um, their cries finally come to, to light. But I'll say that one of the things that um, I've tried to shine a light on are opportunities to incorporate environmental justice into the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And that can happen in a number of different ways from um, making sure that there are specific grants that are targeted for minority and underserved and under-resourced communities to things as simple as um, revising the language in the request for applications so that everyday citizens can understand it and possibly apply for the funds. 
And so there's there's a range of actions that can be taken to to make sure that the um, program and the initiative is serving all of the people that it's supposed to serve. And um, thank you for that, Crystal. And Bob, I know that there are a few folks in the chat asking, you know, for specifics on what it looks like. And I think you're obviously involved in doing some of the on the ground work here in Michigan and the Detroit River. Can you talk about what that work looks like and how the initiative has played a role? Um, and then just to further complicate the question, beyond the initiative, what are the other big contributors to the Detroit River's revival? Well, I, I know Crystal is taking uh, 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 kudos for the for the Cuyahoga burning, but we also celebrated our 50th anniversary of the burning of the Rouge River last year. So, you know, I think there's a lot of similarities. I've, I've worked in the Cuyahoga River, and I I, have, I worked uh, many years ago there, and I, as I have uh, in the in the Rouge and the Detroit River, and uh, like I say, um, you know. We've really seen quite a turnaround. I look at I look at my experiences on the Detroit River and and, and when, when I started in the 80s uh, uh, and the, the water quality and issues. And I, you know, coming from my background was in reconstruction and management and things like that. You know, I really didn't have the environmental understanding that I do today. But what I saw and what I learned really set the pace for for probably what I'm doing today because of that. And and I it's just hard to put into words uh, the improvements that I've seen from from my earlier experiences, but even when I started uh, working for the Friends of Detroit River 20 years ago and went back up in the Rouge and saw it had improved dramatically, but there was still a lot of issues there. But in the in the last uh, you know 10 to 15 years uh, since then, um, that those issues have have greatly improved. So we see continual processes and improvements that that are related to the funding and, and the work that's being done. But again, coming back to the GLRI. Um, you know, that really, like I say, is really accelerated work. Getting kind of specific on some of the things we're doing, um, uh, part of the work we need to do to, to, uh, to remove uh, Detroit uh, AOC uh, uh, and delist it or, or clean it up is um, doing a number of uh, habitat restoration projects. And uh, we actually have 16 projects that we're working on and they vary from uh, fish spawning reefs to, to major uh, habitat restoration work. Um, we've done work on Belle Isle. And, and other parts throughout the Detroit River. We're doing some major projects in the lower Detroit River on some of the state and federally owned properties, uh, uh, the islands, Sugar Island, uh, Southern Island, Stony Island. So those are, those are really um, are going a long way in, in helping to, to, uh, to uh, improve or replace and protect some of the habitat. We've lost over 95% of the coastal wetlands that used to exist in the Detroit River pre-settlement. We're never gonna get back to that but we're certainly working to get to better than where we are. But uh, the next big swing, and I think this is where the GLI is really gonna kick into gear here, um, particularly with this additional billion dollars is gonna be allocated. From what I'm hearing is a lot of that money or, or a good portion of that is gonna help go towards remediating sediment. And, and we have uh, in the Detroit River, based on just decades and probably over 150 years of uh, relatively unregulated discharges from industrial municipal waste, somewhere between three and my five million cubic yards of sediment that have to be uh, assessed and remediated. So it's gonna take a lot of money to do that. And, and this mechanism uh, working through the GLR, I think is gonna help provide a lot of the funding to kind of do that. So as we finish off our habitat restoration work that we're doing, we're now switching gears with the, in parallel with the funding that's available and really uh, working on getting the, uh, these contaminated sediments uh, uh, taken care of. And that's definitely going to go a, a long way in helping improve the water quality and habitat and uh, biota in the Detroit River. And a question for both of you, um, but I'm going to start with Crystal because I know that Bob, your focus is is really, you know, more local. Um, are there certain waterways right now that have a higher need than others or are you know worse off than others and can you speak to where are they and why are they you know in greater peril than potentially some others in our region yeah again i think um we've talked a lot about aocs the areas of concern are the the major areas that have been identified for you know 
opportunity is the nice way of putting the fact that it, it, there are major areas that need to be cleaned up. And that's, um, we see lots of them throughout the Great Lakes. I believe there are 43 areas of concern within the Great Lakes that, that need to be addressed. And so that is, should be a focus one of the major focuses of the Great Lakes uh, restoration dollars that we're seeing. Um, and they are for different reasons. Um, Bob kind of outlined some of the issues that we're seeing. Again, I'm in Ohio and so I'm sorry to keep taking it back there, but um, a lot of it is you know, agricultural runoff and um, just degraded water quality. And so there, there are a number of issues and areas that we've outlined and we know where they are. We know what needs to be done. And this funding will help us get there again, coupled with other actions that are happening on the ground and at the state level as well. And a question for both of you. You know, when the initiative began, uh, this was 10 years ago, they were thinking about known problems of the time from that agricultural runoff that causes the algae blooms in Lake Erie and Saginaw Bay to the industrial contamination that you were both just talking about to habitat loss. And even in just the 11 years since, you know, we've learned about PFAS. Um, climate change has become an increasingly uh, obvious concern. Um, Microplastics are also kind of an emergent issue. I'm curious, have our efforts kept pace with sort of this evolving sense of what the problems are and, and sort of a, an ever lengthening list of things that we're aware of now, but maybe weren't in 2010? And um, Bob, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I, I, I could jump in on that. Yeah, you know, it, you're exactly right. And, you know, we've been at this pro process for a long time. And, and when we've put these plans together and the things that needed to be done to clean up the Detroit River, and I can speak specifically for our area of concern, you know, we, we had no clue of what PFAS was or pet coke or, or, or microplastics or, or, or the impacts of pharmaceuticals. Um, they're not, they weren't known at the time, but I've got to say, and, and I'll put in a plug for our, our, our state, uh, uh, Department of Environmental Quality, um, you know, they've kind of really taken the lead on PFAS. And I can speak specifically here in the Detroit River, because if, if you're aware that the Huron River uh, really has a problem, and they've done a lot of work in, uh, on that. And we've had, you know, a lot of efforts going into that. So that, you know, they've kind of stepped up to, to kind of, um, you know, move that process forward to do the gather the data necessary to find out where the sites are, you know, put in the, you know, state the wide limits on what, you know, they should be and really kind of taken taken uh, you know a, 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 I think a much broader approach than some other states have done so so but so getting back to the to the emergence I think we you know as as these 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 emerging contaminants and and, and different things come to light we need to be resilient and, and flexible enough to kind of figure out what it is how it's impacting the environment how we deal with it and then move and keep moving forward I think you know obviously you know there's probably going to be more in the future and we need to put together some kind of process to do that. But again, I think, you know, the, the will is there and the and the interest is to deal with this, but I think it always comes down to the funding. And again, getting back to GLRI and the other funding mechanisms, I think those are very important to keep uh, uh, allowing our, our local and, and state agency folks to be able to deal with these things as, as they pop up. Yeah, I'd agree. I think that um, the charge is on us to not only use the GLRI as the vehicle to address the priorities, the water challenge priorities that have been outlined back when the program created, but we, well, it was created, but we know that a number of other emerging issues are, are going to come up throughout the years. And so we need to create other vehicles to address those issues as well, not um, just continue to just rely on GLRI alone. To, to handle all of this. So I think that we have to think creatively about how to leverage the dollars. Uh, that's another growing conversation with the infrastructure dollars and the American Rescue Plan and the COVID relief dollars. It's when you get one-time funds or you get a competitive grant, it, we're, not, we're no longer in a climate where you can just take this money, do the project and walk away. And we're in a climate where now we're challenged to say, okay, how can I creatively leverage these funds to address this issues and the other connected issues that, that we know exist. 
And what I, what I mean with that is um, we know that there is alignment between the priorities outlined at the federal level with GLRI and a lot of the priorities that we're seeing at the state level and local too. And so how do we take those federal dollars and then have conversations with our states about um, matching those funds or, or complementing those funds? Um, and in Ohio, we created the H2, Governor DeWine created the H2 Ohio program, which is aimed at largely addressing agricultural runoff through um, investment and best management practices. And so again, that's taking those GLRI dollars, we're taking some state investment and then coupling that with some, some local investment as well to really attack these issues. That's the only way that we're gonna be able to put a sizable dent in the issues that we're dealing with. And you just touched on a topic I wanted to ask about. Uh, you know, you're based in Cleveland, right? So, you know, um, right on the shores of Lake Erie, we all know that the Great Lakes are connected and that's downstream from Michigan. So what we do here affects that lake uh, and that like touches part of our state. Um, how effectively have we been using the initiative dollars there? And, you know, one thing that, that we're aware of is that those algae blooms every summer have persisted despite a lot of effort over a long time. What needs to change? A lot needs to change. Um, <laughs> I think that, um, again, it's a continuous body of water. And so what happens in Ohio impacts Michigan and the like. And so, again, it's as a, especially speaking from a regional organization, it's imperative that we have these conversations beyond our state lines. Um, I think that I'm, we have used the money um, the right way, in the right ways, but where there is, again, opportunity is having more um, interstate conversations. And so when the governors can come together and make sizable commitments to addressing these issues um, with definitive plans and a roadmap for how we can address these issues together collaboratively and create that um, larger impact, I think that is an area of opportunity. And so um, I think that we, we have extra tools in the toolbox that we can use if we uh, collaborated uh, a little bit more. Uh, part of it is what, what we're doing in a nonprofit um, community right now is sharing ideas. And um, I know that sounds like, you know, kind of conceptual and, and less of an impact, like it may have less of an impact, but it's a problem when states aren't talking to each other about what's working and what's not. There's no need to, to um, you know, build the wheel all over again. So and essentially what we're doing in the nonprofit community are, is bringing environmental groups together to say, what are you talking about in your state? What have worked? What hasn't worked? How can we collaborate? How can we set up systems for joint advocacy to really implore uh, government and um, private donors and foundation donors to, to bring more money to address these issues in a, in a, a way that really um, does it for the long haul. And for both of you, we, we were just discussing sort of new issues that have emerged since 2010 when, when this funding program first uh, began. Are there any priorities that, that, you, that aren't currently part of the equation here? part of what's funded by the initiative that you think should be. And especially as we're thinking about a bunch of money coming in, you know, as much money over the next five years as the initiative has had in the decade previous, what should we really be prioritizing? And is there anything not on the list that should be? And I'll start with Bob on that one. Well, I was hoping Crystal would jump on that with a broader view. I, I can speak locally and again, specifically to, you know, what we need to do to help improve the water quality in the river even more than where we are today. Um, again, you know, we're dealing with, uh, you know, kind of getting back to, uh, we've been working a long time on the Detroit River and we, we, we made a lot of improvements and we're seeing, what we're seeing on locally here on our end is that, you know, some of the issues that we're dealing with are not actually being generated in the Detroit River, but being generated in the tributaries and the watersheds. And I think, you know, that stormwater related and, and, and certain sanitary type situations and land use. So, you know, those are important, but, but I, I can't help but getting back. And, and again, I'm so happy that we've had this 
the, the infrastructure bill passed and bringing monies into the state to help improve that. I think, you know, it's critical that we really want to get to where we're going to be to finally be able to, to kind of finish off the work we're doing in the AOC is we really got to get some improvements in our sanitary systems and dealing with combined sewer overflows and things like that, along with stormwater and things that are coming in from, uh, from the watershed. So, you know, those are things that we're really kind of focusing on and kind of moving our interests uh, inland more to kind of go to the source of where some of these things are coming in. And, and as we've been dealing with and, and, and kind of slowly eliminating um, the issues that we have directly on, on the Detroit River. I think that's great. I think um, to add on to that, I think I, I've said it before, um, there is an opportunity to incorporate environmental justice into the GLRI. Um, that can be done in a myriad of different ways. One of the conversations that I find myself having pretty frequently is the fact that um, there are systems set up and there's statute that require uh, public meetings and comment periods and hearings. But again, uh, for everyday citizens, those are, they're, they're full of technical jargon and really hard to access sometimes. And so what I like to see is some um, community engagement from the beginning stages of talking about GLRI and putting out a request for applications and talking about outreach and engagement all the way through to awarding the grant with, with specific um, set-asides for communities that um, are in the most um, need. And so I think that's an area of opportunity. In addition to that, I'd say innovation and technology. Um, I think I get probably a phone call every other week from someone who has an amazing idea for how to address some of the water challenges plaguing our Great Lakes. And what we need is additional funding to really invest in these ideas and especially ideas that have the scalability and that have been proven um, so that we can address the challenges. We're not in a climate where we have the luxury of being able to say, we're just gonna focus on these best management practices and hope that the, the um, algae blooms go away or the issues that we're dealing with go away. We're in a climate where we have to think innovatively and use um, all of the resources that we have available to us. And so further investment in innovation and technology, I think is a worthy investment. And Crystal, you were just talking about, you know, the, the your hope that environmental justice is really prioritized. Uh, you know, this idea, um, of doing this work, not just for the sake of fish, but for humans, right? Centering humans in it. Um, and I've heard a lot of people talk about that also with this idea of if we're gonna do work that helps the river or the lake, and you know, there's a lot of money involved, how can we also make sure that it includes secondary benefits for the people who have been most harmed by the pollution? Um, are there any interesting examples out there of that kind of work and that kind of thinking? I think not, I'm not aware of interesting examples, but definitely ideas. I've had the luxury of working with um, some colleagues in Toledo who were impacted by the Toledo water crisis. And um, coming from a minority community that's disproportionately impacted by the COVID pandemic, um, they have dealt with a lot. And so as an impacted community, um, and with coupled with this pandemic, I'm thinking a lot about the benefits of the lake. And we know that the lakes and water are a source of healing and respite. And so how do we leverage this amazing resource we have here to benefit some under-resourced um, communities during this time? And so uh, I've had conversations about how we address access issues so that those communities can then get to the lake and enjoy the benefits of the lake. And so I think those are um, some of the examples of finding ways to creatively um, build the connection to the lakes for people. Yeah, I, I could add to that, Crystal. I think you've got a good point there. And I know in the Detroit area and, and part of the work that we're doing through the Friends of Detroit River and also through the uh, AOC work is, is exactly that. I mean, you know, again, I kind of was kind of alluding to going up into the watershed and, and dealing with situations or issues that are being generated there. There are a lot of areas, uh, you know, 
in the Detroit area, certainly Southwest Detroit and uh, Ecorse and some of the areas around the more industrial uh, uh, parts of the of the river and the and, and the watershed where a lot of these communities exist. And that we're really trying to reach out and 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 work in those areas to try to to, to deal with those situations. Because again, those are impacting areas of the Detroit River, but that connection that you're talking about, bringing those people out to, to the river. You know, there's so much work that's been going on, particularly up in Detroit with the work that's being done with the Detroit River Front Confederacy and creating, taking some of these old industrial properties and creating parks and, and, and avenues for people to come out and, 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 and see the river and appreciate it. Uh, and 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 uh, you know to, to to do things that they you know or get access to things they haven't been able to do. So I think it's a very uh, poignant point that you're making and something that we're really you know really working for in all of the work we're doing and trying to do that because we need to 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 equally work at all the communities to take care of the problems we have to help benefit not only you know our work with the habitat but the people that, that reside in those areas as well. And, and I'll add on to that, that um, I just feel like we're at a juncture where um, in order to do this community engagement work authentically um, and in, in the right way, we're going to have to meet people where they are. And so I did a listening tour several years ago and had the opportunity to listen to communities and they talked about their connection to the lakes. And for some, it's their source of recreation and their job. And for others, it's their source of tap water. And that's their connection. Um, some have the lake right outside of their backyard. And for many, they say, well, the lake is about 10 miles away, but I don't have a car. And on the bus, it takes me at least an hour to get to the lake. And so this, we're dealing with a, a very diverse population across the lakes that we need to meet everybody where they are. And um, it's gonna require us to have different strategies and approaches for how we engage these people equitably. Thank you both. And I want to get to some reader questions too, recognizing that we're uh, moving along on time. Um, one that was interesting to me, uh, someone asked in the chat, how does the initiative interface with efforts to clean up the sixth Great Lakes, you know, our, our groundwater, that's all this fresh water underneath our feet? Uh, is there any effort or focus on that? Not to my knowledge, I'm, I'm less versed on the, the, the intersection between GLRI and, and groundwater. Again, I'm mostly working at the state level. And so I'm, I'm not as privy to that, um, that connection. I, I could just say for the, the work that we're doing in the Detroit River area, and again, groundwater, you know, most people get their water from Detroit River and, and there's there's few that do that but you know definitely groundwater issues uh, you know along the shoreline and some of these industrial brownfield areas that are being remediated to, that have contributed to some of the contaminants we have in the river are, are certainly being looked at and, and, and addressing those so at least in the local you know groundwater that's associated with the Detroit River is something that's uh, it's, it's uh, high on the radar whenever we're, we're doing assessments on any of the properties that uh, we're working to to remediate. I can't speak farther than that in, on a state level because we certainly have areas around the Great Lakes where groundwater is extremely important um, and, and, and certainly um, concerns about what uh, groundwater withdrawals and, and, and cross-contamination from surface uh, activities, but that's kind of out of my realm. Another um, listener uh, viewer is asking a question. What is the legal mandate of communities that are on Great Lakes areas of concern and have benefited from cleanup uh, and continued public access to maintain um, that public access, as opposed to you know maybe this threat of developers capitalizing on the cleaned up lake shore. I'm curious if you're seeing any of that type of thing going on. I think it was Crystal you provided the stat that for every dollar spent on restoration, there's this economic benefit. Who's getting that? And is there any sort of obligation to, you know, protect access to these places uh, when the cleanup creates an economic opportunity that people may want to jump on? You know, I, um, I'm not sure, but I think that's worthy of conversation. A lot of times when we talk about accountability, we talk about accountability with government. 
and um, making sure that they are spending the dollars the right way and equitably. But I think that it really begs the, the question about whether we should be holding um, people that are around cleaned up areas accountable to keep it clean um, too. So I think um, it's, it's worthy of a conversation for sure. And Bob, I see you're unmuted. I just want to make sure you you're not waiting to jump in there before I. Ask. Yeah, well, like I say, uh, you know, to answer that question, majority, almost all of the habitat restoration work that we're, we we are doing is on publicly owned property, whether it's federally owned or state owned, so that that property is held within the public trust. And a lot of the sediment remediation work that's being done in the Detroit River is is on public land as well. It's it's waters of the Great Lakes, so. Um, there's very little that we're doing that's actually connected to privately owned um, properties, but in, in any anywhere that we do, because we have we do have one uh, 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 project that's uh, on a so private property, but um, uh, conservation easements and things like that to hold these uh, these habitat restoration portions of it in, in perpetuity are in place, and and being that they're in a wetland area, this be very hard to develop uh, uh, down the road anyway. So. Um, you know, again, a lot of a lot of the of the work being done is 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 in publicly held uh, trust. Another reader or viewer, excuse me, can you tell I'm used to writing stories instead of sitting in front of a camera? Um, <laughs> another uh, reader mentions, you know, Lake Erie was declared dead 30 years ago and recovered through policy action, but now it's facing this algae bloom, the toxic algae bloom problem that we've mentioned a few times here. Um, they say we can restore bodies of water uh, with these investments, but what are two or three policy actions needed to make sure we don't backslide? Can, can both of you address that? Crystal, I'm gonna let you tackle that one. <laughs> You're the policy person. <laughs> Um, let's see. So policy actions to make sure we don't backslide in terms of our, our progress on Lake Erie. Is that the question? They mentioned Lake Erie specifically, but I'm not sure okay. if they were, you Just, know, more broadly. Yeah. So I think there, there are a number of things. I think there has to be some accountability for the investments being made. Again, accountability keeps coming up. Um, if we're, we're, we're putting money into programs and we can't clearly articulate the, the return on investment um, over years, then we need to reevaluate whether we need to continue to put money into those programs. Um, in terms of policies, I think that um, it, a lot of people will consider it a, a bad word with, when we talk about regulation, but I think that we have to think beyond just voluntary measures to address the um, phosphorus going into the lakes. And so we know that uh, voluntary measures alone won't work. And so our, won't work in, in a way that really addresses the issue for the long haul. And so that's a conversation that needs to happen. Um, in terms of policy, we need to talk about um, additional investment at the state levels um, that last multi years. Um, I think we're, we've been in a cycle where we're super excited about, um, you know, the investments that are being made, but um, that's only until the next budget year when we all have to storm the Capitol in the state house. I don't like to say storm the Capitol because that's not what I'm about, but <laughs> we all have to go to the Congress and um, uh, go to the state houses and ask for additional investment. And I don't think that if, if, if we, we've made the case and we told the stories, we shouldn't have to continue to, to um, outline why this is a great benefit um, for all of the, the legislative districts across the, um, the state. And so I think those are additional investment and communi uh, community outreach and engagement is another area where I think that um, in terms of policy opportunities is something that I'm really stressing. Um, we are not equitably, I don't know of places that are equitably um, and long-term engaging communities in policy conversations um, the way they should be. And I think that that needs to happen. We need to have people from every part of the state, every part 
um, every uh, geographic area, every race, um, every socioeconomics, in, part of the socioeconomics inside of these conversations to talk about the impacts um, of the potential policies that we're discussing. Um, too many meetings, and I speak from experience, too many meetings that I go into, I'm the only person that looks like me. And that's a, that's a lot of labor and a lot of pressure. And I think that um, we need to be equitably in, engaging others in this conversation. I'm curious myself if that, um, writing a story on this topic a, a couple of weeks ago, that came up too, the idea that, you know, it's, it's been a while, a lot has changed, should we be re-engaging um, people on this? Are there, is that happening right now as the, EPA and other agencies think about how to spend these funds? Are they going back to communities on the ground and asking those questions to your knowledge, either of you? Absolutely. They, I know that they're having the conversation and there's the will um, at the federal level and at the state level to, to engage communities in this process. Quite honestly, I'm having very realistic and transparent conversations with, with agencies about trying to figure out what is the right way to do that. Um, because there is a science to it. It's not just we're going to just go out and just find anybody and have these conversations. Um, at the Alliance for the Great Lakes, we have principles for community engagement. There's a set of principles and rules that you have to follow if you want to equitably engage communities in these conversations. And so that's making a commitment to not tokenize the, com the conversations, not to be extractive without investing back in these communities. And so agencies want to do this work. Um, and some of them are at the stage where they are kind of paralyzed in how to do that in the right way. And so in, in the ENGO community, we're working collaboratively with, with um, stakeholders who want to have those conversations about how we can partner to make these things happen. Uh, another um member of the audience has asked about shoreline erosion. And obviously we are just coming down from record high Great Lakes water levels uh, that did a lot of damage and, and caused a lot of concern over the past couple of years. Is, is shoreline erosion um, at all a part of, of the work that's being funded here? And, and how do you deal with that? And I know, Bob, uh, when I talked with you, I think we had some conversations where you talked about how fluctuating water levels influenced the way that you did habitat restoration in the Detroit River. So can you speak to that as well? Yeah, very much so. And we, we started doing design on a lot of the projects that we're working on today back in 2012, 2013. If you remember the Great Lakes water levels were actually low. Many of the uh, uh, communities around the Great Lakes that have harbors were, were looking to get funding to help do dredging work so they could keep their harbors open. Um, you, you go a few years in advance on that. We started doing our projects in 2018 and uh, uh, the water levels started coming up. And by 2020, um, the water levels in the Lower Detroit River reached the highest they ever have been on record. And, and Noah and, and the Army Corps of Engineers have been uh, monitoring water levels for well over 100 years. So, um, you know, it, it create, created a lot of issues. And uh, certainly there was shoreline flooding and erosion. But even within our projects, we had to do some major on the fly redesigns to increase the, the size and, and some of the work of scope that we did to help protect uh, uh, areas that weren't impacted, uh, uh, you know, at the time when we were designing them. So, um, you know, we, we, you know, and again, we can get in a whole climate uh, uh, change discussion here, but, you know, we're seeing higher highs and lower lows, and it's, it's kind of hard to, to kind of, uh, uh, you know, when you're doing design work to uh, anticipate what you're designing for, because uh, everything's changed now uh, with, with what we anticipate the highest water levels are going to be, and, and we're assuming we're going to, if we get into uh, drought conditions, that the water levels are going to drop lower than they were before. So, so to answer your question, yes, there's, it's, you know, it's considerations we had to deal with. We had to deal with them when we we're doing the work. And I think, um, you know, uh, the whole climate issue is, is something that's going to have, you know, great impact on the Great Lakes, uh, you know, far into the future here. And, and I think it's, you know, as coastal communities uh, around the country uh, that are that are seeing higher water levels in the ocean levels. Uh, you know, I think we were going to we're going to be seeing higher and lower levels in the Detroit River, uh, depending on the cycles. And Crystal, do you have any insight into that on a regional level? Are shoreline issues uh, and erosion being addressed through this work? 
Yeah, I know that there are some GLRI funded projects that reduce um, or designed to reduce um, erosion and near shore habitat loss. Um, I'm aware of the, um, the Army Corps of Engineers working with the, the Chicago District um, conducting a pilot project um, in Illinois Beach State Park in Zion, Illinois. And so I think that it's, it's part of the conversation and there is funding that is going towards those efforts. And I know we're getting kind of close to our time. Catherine, do we have time for one more question? Um, I'm just curious, you know, if you had to identify this, what would each of you make your top priority for the next few years, given that we have this funding boost? You know, if there's one thing that you could say you definitely want prioritized, what would that be? Do you want me to jump in? Sure. Yeah, yeah, I think as far as the work we're doing here and, and trying to complete the work for the AOC and the Detroit the River, I think, uh, you know, additional funding coming in to help address the, the contaminated sediment issues that uh, really are something that uh, is going to take a lot of money to address is something that we're really would really like to see happen. And we're hoping that, uh, you know, with the new funding coming in, uh, we're going to see more more of that to help uh, work on this issue. Yeah, and I, again, I'll say delisting areas of concern and um, incorporating environmental justice are the two things that are, are my priorities when it comes to GLRI and two opportunities that I see with the influx of funds. Thanks to you both. And um, I'm hesitant to ask more because I know we are coming up on the hour and I want to be respectful of folks' time. We had a lot of questions we didn't get to. Um, so to those whose questions we didn't get to, I apologize. There were a lot of good ones. Um, and I will kick it to Catherine. Well, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Robert, for your great insights on this. Like Kelly said, I know we had a lot of great questions about this. Um, that bodes well for the rest of our series, because I know that we're going to have some great conversations regarding a lot of these topics coming up throughout the year. As a reminder, this is a series. So our partner in this series is Circle of Blue. Thank you. We also want to give a very special thank you today to our funders for this six-part Great Lakes series, the Fred A. and Barbara M. Herb Family Foundation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone who participated today. As a reminder, we'll be posting this recording in Bridge. So if you would like to share the recording or review it, it'll be available hopefully tomorrow. Um, and stay tuned for our next discussion coming up in March. Um, we will be announcing that very soon. And we just wanna thank you everyone again. Um, and we look forward to having you join us in the future. <laughs>